Production of Auto Line this week is underwritten by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine This Week, where the conversation is going to be all about cloud computing, but maybe not the kind of cloud computing that you're familiar, familiar with. In this case, it's about how the auto industry might be using this for its procurement and supply operations, also known as purchasing. And joining me for today's conversation are Fred Hensel, the Managing Director of Procurement Advisory for the consulting firm KPMG. Tim Burke is the Vice President of Global Automotive for the software company Plex. And Matt Rausch is my colleague. He's the tech editor uh, at WWJ, a station that I also happen to do work on. And great having all of you here for this discussion. Well, thanks. Nice to be here. Thanks, nice to be here. Uh, Fred, let me talk with you, or start with you. Cloud computing, you, you put everything in the cloud, uh, everybody I think knows about that sort of thing. What do you mean about using this for purchasing, and especially in the auto industry? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, part of that's situational, you know, depending on uh, where a particular company or, or uh, procurement department is sitting um, and uh, <clears throat> what they want to accomplish out of it, right? So I was talking to Tim earlier. Some companies are looking for the ground up, the whole ERP system. Other companies have made that investment sort of inside the four walls uh, of, of a, uh, an ERP, an SAP, or other system, and they want to uh, get more value by extending that, con uh, that, that concept outside of the four walls. Uh, how do I uh, integrate, have more visibility with my suppliers? How do I collaborate more across my supply base? And how do I reduce the risks inherent in my supply base? Uh, so, so I think these are a number of the reasons that, that people really look into the cloud for some of their purchasing functions. Tim, explain that. Uh, how are they doing it today, and how does putting things in the cloud make it different for these companies? So, so what's interesting, for our customers, um, their entire applications that they run their business on are in the cloud. So Plex Online is a cloud um, ERP service provider for software as a service. Uh, procurement is a piece of what they do. So, you know, essentially, uh, throughout the supply chain, you know, the communications are through electronic document information, right? So what are the requirements from a production uh, perspective? Uh, the, our customers take that feed in from their customers, blow it through a bill of materials, and then send the purchase, purchasing requirements out to their supply chain, down the, down the tier two supply chain. So prior, in the old days, this was all done by paper, and then it slowly started well, to become I, electronic? You know, and traditionally, and I, and I think a lot, of, a lot of Fred's customers have a system internally that they use to do that, right? Um, and well, that's, it was fax machines for a while. Well, I, it? It absolutely, and yeah. in fact, and I would argue that that still happens today. <clears throat> you know, uh, as you get further throughout the supply chain, you've got uh, suppliers that, that aren't as technologically advanced, perhaps, as some of the larger ones. Um, I think with the advent of the cloud, we're seeing you know, newer technologies be available to those lower tiered suppliers. Uh, but you're right, in the past it was all done in-house. Uh, a lot of that information was communicated via fax. Uh, could be an email, could be uh, a phone call, mm. you know, those types of things. Well, one of the things I was wondering is that, you know, a lot of this is very sensitive information. We all know the industry treats future product designs like state secrets. Uh, you know, how do you make sure that, that this information stays secure? It's interesting. I mean, the, the, the pieces that uh, our customers really get concerned about are, are certainly intellectual property, right? The drawings for their designs. Uh, often what they will do is, is maintain those drawings in-house and simply point to them, uh, point to the server through our application. So we maintain um, kind of the revision control for that drawing, but the customer themselves keeps that document inside their four walls. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty consistent. Uh, we're seeing a lot of sensitivity as well around uh, some of the contracts uh, that our clients have in place with their suppliers. There's a lot of sensitive data information there, everything from pricing to terms and conditions. Uh, so, so we see those as uh, probably emerging um, in terms of uh, clients being willing to to put that data out there and start down that collaboration path. Uh, so, so most clients are probably starting more with uh, uh, establishing a supply network, uh, managing content, exchanging documents, some of which used to be done, especially in the auto industry, via EDI, but there are better, faster, cheaper ways and more flexible ways uh, to do that uh, now, uh, thanks to the cloud. And where do you see companies putting what, what kind of information are they putting in the cloud in, in this case, and when it comes to purchasing? Is it uh, 
build schedules for the number of cars they're going to build and all the components that have to fit into it, or, or what? Yeah, we see them starting with the basics, uh, as, as Tim pointed out, starting with the purchase order exchange and the whole uh, orchestration of that, right? Whether it comes, uh, starts off a forecast, uh, turns into a purchase order or a delivery agreement of some sort, uh, all the way through fulfillment of that, the, the ship notice uh, and the invoice and billing. Uh, and then uh, starting to expand beyond that, right, and collaborate on, on, uh, on, on things like sharing drawings and, uh, uh, you know, on the front end of the purchasing process, the e-sourcing and quotation process, uh, we, we definitely think is an opportunity to, uh, to use the cloud more. Um, and that, that uh, is a pretty complex business, especially for some of our automotive clients, right? Uh, that dance of uh, sharing a drawing, getting feedback from the supplier, answering questions, and then uh, having a very detailed discussion about what it's going to cost to build this part. Uh, so we see a lot of opportunity on that end as well. I got to believe then too, once you put this information in the cloud, you can allow your whole supply chain to look at it. Because my understanding now is, the car companies communicate very well with their tier one suppliers, that is the suppliers who supply directly right. to them. But then when you get down to lower tiers, maybe the communication is not so good. Is, is that what this yeah, cloud that's, computing that's does? Right. And it's not just, um, uh, it's visibility, I think, is, is a key part, as well as uh, the fact that that message tends to get disrupted as it propagates through the tiers, right? So uh, bring, bringing uh, more of your tiered suppliers onto a, onto a supply network, for example, allows you to have a direct conversation with them, a direct line of sight as to what your demands are what you're seeing in the in the market and what your needs are going to be that may take a few cycles to propagate through one or two or n tiers <coughs> of the supply base. So are there, are, you, you mentioned collaboration a couple of times. Uh, can you think of an example or two of the kinds of collaboration that these systems make possible, maybe that wasn't possible before, other than the sort of inter-tier ones that we've, we've talked about? You know, I, I wouldn't say um, specifically on the design side, at least in our world, right? Because um, Plex Online really covers everything from um, you know, procurement of materials to shipping them out the door to their customers. Uh, the CAD stuff and the engineering side really is kept to the to those those silos, I guess. Um, but you know, certainly from a containment perspective, if you have a quality issue and your supplier could be uh, responsible for that quality issue, right? You can now communicate in real time. Um, you know what the problem is, mm -hmm. and then you know via alerting capabilities, you can you know signal that supplier to respond to uh, perhaps a, a problem report. Uh, you can exchange, you know, photos of, of uh, perhaps what the problem might be with that supplier, and it's communicating in real time. Whereas in the past, it was, you know, picking up stacks of documents and shipping them out, and that supplier receive them, you know, getting a, a bunch of people on the on the floor, kind of sorting through parts and looking for the bad ones, right? Mm, mm. So traceability is a big thing that, sure. that we're pr providing and enabling. Another, another example I would uh, suggest is on the risk side of it. So. Um, uh, having a visibility and a, a command center. One of my clients has established sort of a command center when they do have a disruption in the supply chain, weather related. Uh, they, they have one specific example of a fire where one of their factories burned down. Mm. Uh, they have all the information in one place that they need to make a lot of critical decisions to adjust schedules, uh, divert products, uh, really quickly and flexibly adjust their supply chain so that they can minimize the impact of their operations. So I just, I just want to mention an advantage, you mentioned a plant burning down, right? Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's a perfect opportunity to, to really address how the cloud would benefit that particular customer, right? So servers aren't on site, data's not lost because that plant fried, right? It's all, you know, when you're in the cloud, you're off site, you're in a protected bank vault facility, uh, you're getting access, access to your data and sharing that with your enterprise also extending that to your suppliers in a very secured environment. Well, ideally in the cloud you're in more than one location, right? You know, that's, you're usually in several data centers, you know, with a, you know, instant swappable if there's a problem with a data center. Exactly right. Yeah. And certainly the, the auto industry has seen a number of disruptions in the, just the last few years. You, you mentioned fires, I can think of two that everybody was sweating bullets over. You had the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan that was horrific. You had the flooding in Thailand. And I mean, as you all know, it's a global industry. This ripples through. It, it, I don't think there was one automaker not impacted by those things, even though sitting here, it was fairly remote from yeah. where we are. That's right, and I, and I think a lot of the OEMs, because of those uh, tragedies, are rethinking how they source their suppliers, too. Um, so we see opportunities Absolutely. open up you know, yeah. uh, globally for additional people to fill that uh, capacity. Right? Yeah. Well, how, how good are the automakers at adopting this? My understanding is that uh, the high-tech companies have been into this cloud computing for sure. purchasing for a number of years now, but, but 
automotive is only just sort of sticking its toe in the water here. You know, what's, what's interesting, I, I think, um, you know, the software as a service companies, you know, have utilized the cloud really to, to uh, distribute their software, right? And Salesforce.com from a, a CRM perspective was the big leader in that. Um, we're seeing quite a few more companies adopt the technologies really because of a couple of things that happened in our market, right? We saw the industry drop in 2009 and a lot of those companies just, you know, barely struggled to stay alive. They shed a lot of resources. They certainly weren't focused on maintaining big IT staffs. So as the volumes have come back, we've seen suppliers really, you know, kind of scramble. You know, what do we do to make sure that we're keeping those machines up and available all the time uh, with the limited number of resources that we have today? And cloud has been a good solution for them because they haven't had to beef up and build the IT department and all the people to maintain that system, right? That's they can leverage one them. of the things I was going to point out that automakers love variable costs, right? They want to be able to, you know, cut costs when times are good and add stuff very quick, or when times are bad rather, and add stuff very quickly when times are good. And that's one of the big advantages of cloud computing. It's virtually an entirely pay-as-you-go system. Exactly. You're only paying for the resources you need when you use them, uh, whether it be storage or software or IT personnel. And all of this stuff can be scaled up very, rapidly. That's right. So, I come back to my question, I'll, I'll throw it to you here, Fred. Uh, where does automotive stand vis-a-vis -vis other industries, especially the high-tech industry? Yeah, I, I, th I think probably a little bit behind in some ways, the high-tech industry. Um, uh, you know, some of the Cisco's, the, the electronic uh, manufacturers, uh, were pretty early adopters of some of these broad-based networks. Of course, you they know, outsource so much. They, they, I mean, they, they literally use contract manufacturing. Yeah. The automotive companies, including suppliers, yeah. are, are more vertically integrated on that yeah. basis. But I think, I think the autos still have some of those same challenges, right? So, again, Again, getting back to uh, visibility across the supply chain um, and, and really being able to collaborate with your customers. So I, I, I definitely think that uh, mostly in the auto industry it's about figuring out where to start and, and how to uh, really get some traction. Uh, and you know, I don't think they're tremendously behind. You know, maybe uh, five or ten years uh, in some in some cases. The, I don't know. Five to ten years sounds way <laughs> behind in my book, especially in a, in a business. Uh, you know, the speed of business today is so much faster. I was going to say, are those internet years or <laughs> yeah, yeah. regular years? Right. Yeah. Right. So I mean, I was I was wondering, is there anyone you think you know you can think that's doing a particularly good job, and what are the hallmarks of companies that are doing a a really good job? If you don't want to name names, it's understandable. Um, I think um, some some of the hallmarks are, um, you know, that that you uh, really think through the challenges and and what you're trying to to accomplish, um, and make sure that you know it's not a technology only uh, approach to to the to the solution, uh, and think through all the levers of change. Right, as you put some of these tools and processes in place. You really have to rethink through your organization. Your roles and responsibilities are going to change. Uh, maybe even the skills and training that your people are going to need uh, are going to have to change. Uh, you need to think through the supply base and understand what the supply base is capable of, right? Uh, are you dealing with uh, companies that are up and ready to go uh, almost on an EDI type level of integration? Or are you dealing with companies with less sophistication that maybe are running on a, an Excel spreadsheet and are going to need more of a, a, a web page type interface to, 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 your, to your portal? Um, and then what's the appropriate ramp up period, right? Um, you know, we've seen, uh, I guess, negative examples of, of clients that put a lot of effort into infrastructure and, and build the highway, if you will, uh, but they, they don't do such a good job bringing the suppliers with them. You know? So they've got a great highway with no traffic on it. Uh, so that really paying attention to the supplier enablement plan, I think, is critical. Um, and then the, the third thing I would say is, is paying attention to your master data, right? Um, as, you, as you look at a lot of these um, platforms and tools, uh, to the extent they're not integrated, like a, like a Plex might be, uh, master data becomes critical to making sure that everyone's talking about the same thing, uh, calling a widget a widget, uh, and, and has a, a common uh, point of reference, if you will. Hmm. Well, I know. Uh, is there any particular highway that's better than any other? I know the the OESA, which is the you know the auto suppliers organization, started the collaboration and, and communication network that became known as Covacent, and it's now part of a software company here in Detroit called CompuWare, but it's about to be spin off. There are competitors, obviously, to Covacent. I mean, are, are people using these particular companies? Are they just using the commercial internet? I mean, how, how, do, how do you use you know communication to do this kind of work? There are um, a couple of platforms out there, right? And it really varies depending on what you're trying to accomplish and, and you know, your level of maturity. Um, you know, probably from a sort of purchasing suite uh, perspective. Uh, you see a lot of interest, for example, in, in SAP acquiring Ariba, 
right, and really extending the ERP capabilities uh, beyond, as I said, sort of the, the four walls. Uh, so, so Ariba probably has a fairly comprehensive uh, set of offerings from a procurement function perspective. Um, the, the, there's a pl plenty of other uh, networks coming up. Uh, there's an E2Open, a, a One Network, there are also uh, players that, that, that play in this space. I'm not sure that I would say one is better than the other. I think it would be situational. Mm -hmm. And then there's also our friends in Auburn Hills at Plex Systems with uh, a lot of software of in this regard. That's right. So, so we're, I mean, we we go to the lowest common denominator, right? So it's it's the open internet for us. So any any place that our customer has access to the internet, they can securely get access to their information mm -hmm. and also you know manage it, uh, act on it, but also share it with their suppliers as well. Tim, do you see a difference in interest on a regional basis? I mean, would North America be more into this than Europe or or? What is it? It, it, it? I think it really depends on, on the, the tiered supplier we're talking to because we work really uh, from the lowest tiers up to the higher ones. And often what we see from the, tiered, the larger suppliers is that they're looking for a solution perhaps overseas, perhaps in Asia Pacific, in, in Europe, um, because of the fact that they made an investment in SAP or some of the larger enterprise software, softwares that they don't see value in dropping that solution into a, a smaller you know, type of an operation. And with a cloud-based solution, they can drop something in there without having the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They can effectively, effectively fire it up from Auburn Hills or wherever they are, create that instance for that location, and you know a little bit of training, and you're good to go. Any place you can put a T1 line, you can put that system. That's it, right? Yeah. And I, I would I would comment. That I think the strength of those supplier networks varies tremendously, right, uh, across those regions. So the same uh, supplier network or, or or platform that might work well in North America may not work so well in Asia just because they don't have as many uh, suppliers on boarded, they're not as good in the local language, et cetera. Uh, always a consideration, I think, when you're thinking about a global sure. uh, deployment. So which industry is at the lead of this right now? I, I think you hit it on, on the head. I think it's the, the electronics industry, uh, th those that have the, the problem of managing uh, far-flung contract manufacturers uh, and a, a, a very diverse and complicated supply base. So, and Tim, maybe I'll start with you. How would you advise automotive companies and or suppliers to start the process of going into the cloud for their purchasing? You know, and again, from my, from my perspective, it, it, you know, purchasing is a component of what we, of what we do, right? So, um, you know, I think from a, a, a diligence perspective, you have to look at, you know, what's, what's the end game? What's the goal? You know, is purchasing the only area that you're looking to automate and, and, and improve the business process? Or is it much larger than that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it depends upon the company. You know, you, it, you, you approach solving a problem um, with different options, right? And I think the cloud certainly is a great option for it. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, and I think um, you, you definitely have to think about the integration considerations. Uh, you know, I think the days of a standalone uh, e-sourcing platform and a separate contract management platform disconnected from your inventory platform um, are, are probably uh, you know past. Uh, our, our clients are really looking for those to be much better integrated. Right. Uh, I think uh, there are a couple different ways to do that. Right, some of the offerings uh, have open APIs, easy connectivity, quick integration across, or you can get more of a, a sort of an out of the box uh, package solution like a like a Plex. Yes, and the scariest words in the uh, in this language, I think, are, are infinitely customizable. Uh, you don't necessarily <laughs> want it to be because that means you have to do all those things manually. You want some things to be you know, to be able to shake hands with what you have now right out of the box and not quite be so customizable. That's correct. Yeah. Right. I think there's a definite trend uh, away from customization in in the cloud providers, at least the full software as a service platforms. Uh, I'm assuming Plex is similar. Uh, because you want to uh, keep everyone at the same standard, um, you know, make it very easy and quick to deploy new functionality, et cetera. Uh, you know, I think a lot of these platforms have much more ability to configure uh, the function to what you need, uh, but, but really shy away from what I would call customization. And one of the things I find interesting about all this is about five years ago, everyone was talking about bringing more high tech into the car, whether it be infotainment systems or you know, navigation, uh, all of those things, and the, and the big worry was, well, the the car uh, product cycle is so much longer than the electronics product cycle. How do we synchronize those? Because you, know, you buy a computer and nine months later it's obsolete. Uh, that's you know more like nine years for a car. Uh, you know, I think this is one way that the car product cycle is getting to be, if not equal to, certainly in speed. You know, given the realities of manufacturing, much more like the electronics um, uh, industry in which the, the the car companies are able to change things 
much more quickly than they could before. They're able to, to you know, the, the, the turning radius is getting tighter on them being able to change things, to swap things out, I think, mm -hmm. with these kinds of systems. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, you see more, you know, frequent model refreshes, you know, that, that kind of thing. You're starting that. to see that we're, now. we're also seeing uh, more of a plug-and-play kind of approach to bringing electronics into the car. It's been very interesting to see, I think, two automakers now have gone to open sourcing for apps going yes. into yep. their cars, rather than trying to control it themselves, which is the way that they always tried to do it in the past. So I think you're onto something there, Matt. They, they can use this to bring things into the car faster. Yep. And it's really a paradigm shift, right? Uh, le le leveraging the, the crowd and the community of development for, for those new apps and capabilities, and being able to refresh them outside of the product life cycle, right? There's no need to start from scratch when you can just deploy, a, a, say, a software update uh, over, the, over the cloud. Fred, so how do you assess how the auto industry is getting into this right now? Is it, is it very go slow? Is it look at everybody else? How, how would you assess it? Um, I, I think uh, it's, it's still a little bit of, you know, where do we start? And, um, and, and, and like I said, probably when more so than if. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, coming out of a pretty significant restructuring, there's a, a, a long list of priorities. Uh, so I'm not sure precisely where that is, but I think this is uh, probably pretty high. And when they when, when they do start moving, I think they'll move pretty aggressively. So. And Tim, how do you see it? And as you keep mentioning it, you guys are involved in a lot more than just purchasing. We are. But, but this whole move to the the cloud, how, how would you assess where the auto industry is? You know, it's it's the the majority of our customers are in the industry in in the automotive industry, and our growth has been about 30 percent a year over the past, you know, six or seven years, right? So we're seeing those adoption rates increase uh, pretty dramatically. Um, and we're also seeing the larger tiered suppliers embrace the cloud for reasons of extending their enterprise in ways that they possibly couldn't before. You know, you talked about, um, you know, older vehicles and, and, and there could be an analogy made that the software that they purchased last time they bought an ERP system mm -hmm. is perhaps a 1990s, 90 Buick, right? <laughs> and then today, you know, we've got technologies that are more empowering and, and more uh, conducive to being agile in your business and that's what the cloud is providing, right? It's providing a platform to be able to be more responsive to your customers, to be more um, uh, professional in your business, and to be more uh, productive in your operations. So paint a picture for me. Where, where do you see five years, by, by 2020, where do you see the industry and its use of, of the cloud? You know, it's, it's, if you talk to some of the analysts out there, uh, the migration from, you know, and again, there's two categories, right? There's on-premise and then there's cloud computing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so arguably, uh, the new dollars spent are going to, s to the cloud, right? Because of the, the, uh, the, the advantages in uh -huh. it, right? Uh, so we see quite a bit of growth coming. Yeah, I, I would think uh, m most of your purchasing functions, uh, at least those that you would uh, separate a, a little bit from your ERP, uh, ha have a good op opportunity to be migrated to the cloud, probably starting with uh, the document exchange, the supply network collaboration, uh, supplier risk management, supplier uh, life cycle management, uh, and then probably shortly thereafter, uh, more the supplier collaboration on the innovation and design side, um, and, and, and probably the contract management, and uh, those ones being a little bit, a little bit trailing. And I, I think it, you know, we're going to talk less and less about the cloud going forward because it'll just be, you know, part of the background noise. It'll be asking, like asking a company if they use, you know, do you use electricity on your production line? Well, yes, we do. <laughs> as a matter of fact, so you know, it's it's just part of the background now. I think it, it's it's going to be. It is somewhat foreign now. I, I think because of the way. Um, you know, cars have been built traditionally and sourced traditionally with all these personal relationships and the longer product cycles than a lot of other products. Uh, but, you know, it, it's happening more and more. And there's still room for all those personal relationships and all those, uh, you know, wonderful things about this industry. It's just, uh, it, you know, everything will be done a little bit more quickly and, and you know, through, uh, you know, through these systems, you know, rather than, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be a fax machine maker right now, we'll put it that way. So. Do you, do you find that the, the auto industry might be slow to adopt because it is so global? And I know the high-tech industry is too, but typically uh, high-tech companies tend not to have quite the number of product development centers that the large car companies do. You know, I want to say General Motors has something like six significant product development centers all around the world. Ford's probably close on its heels. Toyota keeps adding more to it. Does that make it more difficult to try to implement this when you have operations all over the world, or is that even a better argument to go ahead and do this? I was just say, I think it's actually an argument, uh, a reason to do it, right? Uh, I'm not sure if there's a root cause for, for, for why adoption hasn't been quite 
uh, what we expect. I think there are signs that, it, that that's coming along. Um, I, I would argue that the, the automotive industry has a very complex supply chain. We, we talked earlier about the tsunami and the, the earthquakes um, I impacting the supply chain. Auto was hit probably harder than any. So I, I really think there's a lot of opportunity there and, and, and probably just different priorities uh, to, to tackle. Yeah, I'd agree. I, um, you know, again, our customers, I think, are in 80 different countries today accessing the systems. I think we'll continue, continue to see that grow for sure. Um, I, I wanted to mention one of the unique things that I, that I think the cloud brings uh, with regard to the collaboration piece of it is that, you know, for many software companies that have a solution out there in the cloud, um, they share a community of users, right? So with that, in, in, in contrast to on-premise solutions where you have, you know, lots of customizations, you know, creating something specifically for your business, in a community-driven approach, you have lots of stakeholders, right? So it's, it's, it's innovation that you don't get inside of a company, but rather it's spread amongst several hundred or several thousand companies, right? right. So the solutions that come out of that community uh, are, are strong and, and, uh, and available for that entire community. So I think that's something that's unique that we're seeing now. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And uh, I see, especially when it comes to product development, that, that community of sharing of ideas from throughout the entire vertical, you know, maybe not just suppliers, maybe you get dealers in there, maybe you get a, a whole bunch of others involved, your, your advertising agencies and the like. I, I think it'd be fascinating to see where this all goes. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, we're going to, to have to wrap it up. I, I can't wait to see where all this cloud computing goes, but especially on the, the purchasing side. And so, Fred Hensel from KPMG, really want to thank you for coming on. Tim Burke from Plex, the software company. Matt Rausch, my colleague, at the, is the tech editor of uh, WWJ. Great having you here as well. Thanks, Jeff. Want to thank all of you for having tuned into AutoLine this week. Production of AutoLine this week is underwritten by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The hybrid game MPG Challenge.